Well, I thought during this period we need a, a laugh more than ever. So if you want to send me a joke, I'd be glad to share the best ones. Extra points if they can be tied into the sermon. Uh, the first one is from our friends Philip and Phyllis. It goes like this. Uh, Bob started to fear his wife Peg wasn't hearing as well as she used to. And so he thought she might need a hearing aid. Uh, not quite sure how to approach her. He called the family doctor to discuss the problem. The doctor told him there was a really simple test that Bob could conduct to give uh, the doctor a better idea about Peg's hearing loss. Here's what you do, the doctor said. Stand about 20 metres away from her and in a normal conversational speaking tone, see if she hears you. If not, go to 10 metres, then five minutes and so on till you get a response. That evening, Peg was in the kitchen uh, cooking dinner while Bob was in the study. He said to himself, I'm about 20 metres away. Let's see what happens. Then in a normal tone, he asked, Peg, what's for dinner? No response. So Bob moves closer to the kitchen about 10 metres away. Peg, what's for dinner? Still no response. Bob moves into the room, uh, room next to the kitchen. Peg, what's for dinner? Again, he gets no response. So he walks uh, into the kitchen, door, uh, through the kitchen door about two metres away. Peg, what's for dinner? Again, there's no response. So he walks right up next to Peg. Peg, what's for dinner? Peg turns and says, for crying out loud, Bob, that's the fifth time. It's chicken. Thanks for that, Philip. Well, friends, today I want to speak with you about outsiders and insiders. Uh, sometimes we feel excluded. Uh, we feel like outsiders, uh, perhaps because of our health, uh, whether it be through hearing loss, theirs or ours. But of course, sometimes we can feel like outsiders uh, through distance. And we're feeling that at the moment, aren't we? Uh, in this season. Uh, we're not part of the groups that we're usually part of. We're not part of the groups that we want to be part of. Um, we can feel like, like, like outsiders based on our ability. Uh, my favourite position on a soccer team, you know, left, right, out. Um, I, I felt sorry for those Olympic swimmers who swam in the heats for the relay teams. Uh, they were left out of the finals when the big swimmers came in, right? And so excluded from the possibility of a gold medal. But of course, the hardest exclusions are the things that we can't change and won't ever be able to change. Uh, and we can feel excluded or outsiders through uh, the, what we're born with uh, or without, uh, whether that be the colour of our skin or our gender or our family background. I'm sure there are many more things that you could name. There are lots of things that can contribute to us feeling like outsiders or insiders. Today we're going to recognise that by rights, being born non-Jews, we are actually in our natural state outsiders to God and his people. Um, and this is one of the dramatic shifts that Jesus' death brings about. Uh, we go from outsiders to being insiders. Now we see this uh, in Ephesians 2. Uh, so three points today. If you're taking notes, here are the three points. The first one, remember that we were part of the distant outsiders. Point two, remember that you in Christ have been brought into the inner circle with God. And three, uh, recognise that that inner circle is growing. Uh, so firstly, remember that you are part of the distant outsiders. Ephesians 2. Uh, press pause and uh, grab your Bible uh, so that you're ready to read along. Uh, Ephesians 2 uh, verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves a circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. You see the first word there, therefore. What's a therefore, therefore? Remember what Pip said last week? We were dead. We were like that tree ripped out of the ground, looking alive but actually dead. And so Ephesians 2 continues in the same way that it started, that pattern of you were but now. That pattern repeats here. And so another way to describe the you were is that you were nat in your natural born state as non-Jews or Gentiles, you were outsiders. 
And all this surrounds the only command in this passage, that is to remember. That is what we're called on to do here, to remember. I've got to be honest, I generally only remember this when I come to Ephesians 2. It's such an important passage for us. Um, The passage is saying uh, what we hate racists saying, your ethnicity is a problem. I'm sorry, what did the Bible just say? Your ethnicity is a problem. Why? Well, verse 11, you in your ethnicity as Gentiles were separate from Christ. Remember what Christ means, the Jewish term for a king, the expected Jewish Messiah. Before he came, before he preached peace, before he shocked Jews and engaged with Gentiles, as was always God's plan, he was expected to be the Jewish king that was to come. Verse 12 expands the meaning of our separation from Christ. We were excluded from citizenship in Israel. I read that, I think, so what? Until I join the dots and remember that my ethnicity is a problem. Because in my state of birth, uh, as a Gentile, I'm separate. I was separate from God. And, And so also verse 12, we were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Uh, When Abraham is promised the land for his people, who is it that the land was taken from? Well, it's taken from the Gentiles, the non-Jews, who are under the judgment of God. Outside of Christ, the promised land is actually not your land. Your ethnicity is the problem here, as Gentiles outsiders to the the Christ. And so verse 12, um, we were without hope and without God. But you say, Tom, there's exceptions in the Old Testament. Uh, True, there's some exceptions. Even in Jesus' family tree, like Ruth and Rahab, who we've met recently, both were Gentiles who were included in God's people and included in God's promises in the same way that God has always worked. That is, by faith. However, that happened in their connection to God's people. They came to faith as part of the Jewish community as uh, part of the the, the promised people uh, of God, of the Old Testament. Uh, You could say also lots of Jews, another exception would be, well, lots of Jews were without faith and and therefore godless. Now that's true too. The Old Testament is full of them. Uh, But Ephesians 2 paints a pretty bleak before picture uh, for us as Gentiles. Someone I read recently summed up our ethnicity problem perfectly. Uh, We were... Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, and godless. We were far away. We were alienated from God, alienated from the people of God. But it's interesting that that's not the way I read the Old Testament. Uh, as I pick up a kid's Bible, uh, every Jew and Gentile matchup outside of Christ, we weren't the Jewish hero. We were the Gentile. So in Ga- David and Goliath, outside of Christ, you're not on Team David, you're on. Team Goliath as a Gentile. Uh, Hagar, the slave woman, versus Sarah, the mother of Israel. Outside of Christ, you're on Team Hagar. In the Old Testament, outside of Christ, we are the cursed, the condemned, the shut out, the godless, the hopeless. Outside of Christ, we are crouched in fear inside the wall of Jericho before they come tumbling down. Ephesians 2 calls on us to remember this. But I forget it. So what? Well, when I forget this, I'm presuming that God loves me just the way I am. But I'm presuming that God loves me just because of what I do for him. Um, they're both false presumptions, right? When, when I think God would be lucky to have me as part of his people, that's rubbish. In our natural state, out of, outside of Christ, outside of God's people, we as Gentiles were stateless, friendless, hopeless and godless. We were far away. We were alienated. And that's why we need. Verse 13, and this is the second point here, uh, that in Christ we are now part of God's inner circle. So your ethnicity was a problem, but verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once, uh, who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 13, greatest relief in the passage, again from the two words, but now. Uh, Greatest description of our identity change that has gone from hopeless to full of hope comes. The next two words, in Christ. Uh, That is what makes the difference there. Uh, How does that make the difference? Uh, How has the difference been made? 
by the blood of Christ. Of course, we've, we've seen that already in Ephesians, haven't we? Uh, for example, in chapter 1, verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And so in Christ we have gone from being far off, uh, having a hopeless, stateless, promiseless ethnicity to being near from being on the outer to actually being in God's inner circle. That's not what only what Jesus did, but that's actually what Jesus said. Verse 17 says, He came, preached peace to you who are far away, and to peace, uh, peace to those who were near. That was Jesus' message. That was Jesus' mission. And, and the apostle illustrates this peace using uh, that, something that we're very familiar with, a fence. Well, he doesn't say a fence. He says a wall. Uh, but just like on the Temple Mount, there was a court of the outsider Gentiles. Between that court and the insiders was a massive wall that separated them as a visual marker, a visual reminder that there are outsiders and insiders here. There are outsiders to the covenants of prom covenant promises of God and there are insiders. And you see what Jesus did. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. That wall, that fence, that marker of insiders and outsiders was obliterated. That was Jesus' work. That was Jesus' mission. That was Jesus' message. Uh, I was chatting with Neil, who does some of the church cleaning and is part of the maintenance team, and he was reflecting on the differences between fences in Brisbane and Sydney. Uh, see, in Sydney, we're used to having those regular height colour fences around our properties. Uh, back in the day, they used to be regulation height paling fences, right? And, and Neil was saying that in Brisbane back in the day, they were just low-wire fences, so that you could actually see into your neighbour's yard. In fact, when you hit the ball into their yard, you just step over the wire fence and grab it. Uh, having lived in both cities, I think we agree that it's fair to say that the height of the fence probably says something about community spirit and friendliness. Well, you compare that to the whopping great massive stone wall that separates Jews from Gentiles, that in Christ is obliterated. Gentiles, we Gentiles, no longer foreigners and outsiders, but, but in Christ, we've been brought near. And you see the apostle here is stretching for an illustration to show just how in a circle uh, God's people are, both Jews and Gentiles. And he de describes the closeness uh, in this way, that they have become one man or, or one human. The apostle is stretching to describe just how closely reconciled we've become as God's people. Have a look at verse 16 there. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Verse 18, for through him we uh, both have access to the, to the Father by one spirit. Uh, like we saw in chapter 1, this is an act of God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are involved. We are reconciled and have access to our Father in heaven by the Spirit and in the Son. Later on in Ephesians 3.12, we see in him and through faith in him, we approach God with freedom and confidence. In our natural state of lack of faith and separation from God's people, we were far away from God, yet in Christ and by his spirit, we can enter into the Holy Father's presence with a freedom and a confidence that we have no right to deserve or expect. Again, what is the command in this passage? The one command? Remember. What happens when we forget that we've been reconciled to God and his people? What happens when we forget that we are part of the inner circle? Well, we act like one of the outsiders. We slip back into those habits of the outsiders. And that's what the apostle goes on to, to, to address in chapter 4, 
to remind us of who we are because who we are drives what we do. Our identity in Christ as God's people gives us a reason to be unlike those around us. Have a look at 4.17. Uh, 4.17 uh, says this, So I tell you and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality and to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and, when you, you, and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, you remember your identity and that leads to rejoicing in who you are and restraint in not being who you were. We remember. So where have we been? Firstly, remember that you are part of the distant outsiders. Secondly, remember that you are in Christ. You're part of the inner circle uh, with God. Now, thirdly, Recognize that this inner circle is growing towards eternity. Uh, all the curses of uh, verse 11 and 12 have been reversed. And you see in uh, chapter 2, verse 19, you see this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Showing the reversal of the curse, the apostle uses three images of what this inner circle is like. Images that are picked up elsewhere in the New Testament. Uh, the new Jew-Gentile community is... Uh, God's kingdom, God's family, and God's temple. Well, we're his kingdom. Uh, we're fellow citizen in, citizens in God's kingdom. Uh, to this international God-ruled community, Gentiles and Jews are, are, are belong on equal terms. Um, the Apostle Paul occasionally played his Roman citizenship card when he was jailed, much to the embarrassment of those who arrested him for fear of the Roman citizens and their unassailable rights. But that citizenship of Paul's has got nothing by comparison to his eternal citizenship in the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God's citizens are free and secure, no longer outsiders. Uh, the apostle doesn't just use kingdom language, he also uses family language, using the word household. See, the kingdom is grand and a household is intimate and close especially if you've been locked down for too long. Previously, a Gentile uh, would not go into a Gentile's house. You see this transition take place in the book of Acts. But now, Jews and Gentiles are in the same household. They are together, children in the father's family, brothers and sisters becoming the most common word to describe Christians in the New Testament. So close in their affection, their care, their support. Now, that is, of course, one of the, the great griefs at the moment, isn't it? That we're not allowed to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not sure the authorities would accept that we're all from the same household. I wouldn't try that if I were you. Uh, the authorities don't think we're part of the same household, but God does. Because we are his household. Now, the final image he uses of this inner circle is this singular growing temple. You see, it's founded on God's word. The Jewish prophets, uh, there are prophets now. The Jewish apostles, there are apostles now. Uh, their words are authoritative. It was their words that the early church gathered to listen to. What the apostles taught, they expected the church to believe and preserve. What the apostles commanded, they expected the churches to obey. So practically, the church is built on the scriptures 
They are our foundation documents. And fundamentally, they line up with the cornerstone. The cornerstone of this temple is Jesus. Essential to the foundation, holding the building steady. Every other thing on the building site takes its place in relation to the cornerstone. But here the apostle pictures Jesus as holding this growing temple together as a unity. For he is the chief cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined and grows. Uh, we talk a lot about being in Christ. Uh, and, and this here gives us a really vivid architectural picture of what it is to be in Christ as the cornerstone. In Christ, the whole building is aligned. Uh, from Christ, the whole building grows. You see that in that last verse, verse 22. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Why is that necessary? You Gentiles who were stateless, hopeless and godless, you are now part of the kingdom. You are now part of the family. You are now growing as part of this temple. Like the Apostle Peter says, we're living stones needing to come to Jesus to be built into a spiritual house. That, that temple in Jerusalem with its exclusive high walls where outsiders knew they were outsiders, that is abolished in, uh, in Christ. Jews and Gentiles are together in Christ. Here we who were far off, we who were of questionable ethnicity, are now insiders. Here we are with others where God dwells, each one of us. As Ephesians 2.10 says, each one of us are God's handiwork. Each one of us created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. We're insiders. Now, most Anglo-Australians don't have much of experience of being ethnically an out outsider. Uh, Indigenous Australians do, first and generation Australians do. A and those groups can help people like me understand the reality of uh, my former reality of being outside of Christ. Our friend Nat, who reads the Bible for us, is originally from South Africa. Uh, I asked her about her experience of apartheid. Uh, this is what she said. Apartheid causes tension and in some cases segregated uh, even families from one another. Sometimes half the family were white, whilst the other half were coloured. Nat says this was demoralising and humiliating to have to go around to the back of a shop or, or to sit at the back of a train or to wait for a different bus just because one was classified as coloured and therefore not part of the inside crowd. Uh, she said we as a family experienced both life as an insider and outsider. Our, our friendship groups transitioned the spectrum of classification and so made us vulnerable, especially during the riots. It was a difficult time, even though you supported the abolition of apartheid, because your friends were white, they questioned your loyalty. I'm so grateful for Nat's reflections here, uh, partly because it helps me to know Nat and her family better, partly because it helps me understand the experience of those who feel like outsiders, but partly because it helps us understand our reality, our situation outside of Christ, as outsiders to Christ, outsiders to the promise. Uh, outside of Christ, entrance into relationship with God isn't actually for you. Uh, uh, you're outside of his people. Uh, outside of Christ, you can't, you, you can't go where they're going. Their God is not for you. You see, that's our natural state outside of Christ. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near. By the blood of Christ, uh, what, what, what's the one command in this passage? Remember. Remember who you were outside of Christ. Remember who you are in Christ and recognise that growing inner circle that you're part of as we seek to grow in Christ and make him known. I'm going to close in prayer. Holy Father, in your Son you have made us to be a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, your own special possession. You have done that so that we may declare your praises in our words and in our lives. 
For you called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. Once we were not a people, but now we are your children, your, your kingdom, your temple. Father, please help us to live this out, remembering all that you have done for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.